It's great to be here, and uh, it's lovely to know that we've also got our Zoom community uh, with us. And some of those have reappeared in the flesh today here in church, so we're, we're, we're thrilled about that. So we're going to worship the Lord, and um, I just want to uh, encourage you to be still. As we enter worship now, we pause to be still to breathe slowly, to recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. Creator God, who formed humanity from dust, breathe in us again. Revive us and sanctify us by the power of your spirit. Set our hearts on fire with the good news of your gospel. Amen. Now we're going to sing our first hymn, which is Before the Throne of God. Let's stand as we sing. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart i know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can bid me then depart no tongue can bid me then depart Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. To look on him and pardon me To look on him and pardon me Behold him there, the risen lamb My perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God Do sit please I'm going to continue in prayer and uh, an opportunity just to acknowledge our failings Gracious God, we have hurt others, and we have been hurt. We have presumed upon others, and we have been presumed upon. We've taken others for granted, and we have been taken for granted. 
We have dishonored others. And we have been dishonored. And together, as we receive your forgiveness for our wrongs, we extend forgiveness to others who have wronged us. Have mercy upon us all. Amen. In a moment, we're going to move into a time of intercession, praying for our world, but particularly praying for Ukraine. I'm going to ask Guy if he'd like to just come out now and um, just share some news about the com this community's involvement in supporting our Ukrainian friends. Guy. Uh, thank you, Tim. So um, we've been involved a little bit with the group that's supporting the Ukrainian refugees that are beginning to arrive now in the Pays d'Ono. And the first thing that, that surprised me is actually that there's, it's all done by volunteers. There doesn't seem to be any sort of official structure in the Pays d'Ono. It's very well organized at the confederation level and to somewhat at the cantonal level. But at the regional level, there's, it's being done by volunteers. And there, there's, a, I would say, about 20 or 30 volunteers. At Odile, you were at the meeting. And they've been extremely active in, in terms of volunteering their time. And there's a, they put together a WhatsApp group where people are offering to take people around there. I think there are about 10 or 12 families now in the Pays d'Ono. There are two in Rossignol and about 10, I think, in Châteaudet and Les Moulins. Um, and it's, I, for me, I actually think it's very gratifying to see the warmth and the, the generosity of spirit that has been extended by this community to these refugees who are coming from obviously very hard times. Um, in terms of just, just to keep you abreast of, of what's going on, there's, as I said, there's a WhatsApp group which has is, which is been uh, set up just to exchange information. There's also a site which we hope to get up hopefully tomorrow which will give a more structured approach to the information. Next Saturday, there's going to be an event at La Salle des Monaires, where there's going to be a folkloric evening where the refugees, I don't know what, if it's refugees is the right word, but the Ukrainians who are here, the women, mainly women and children, will be putting on um, some sort of demonstration of Ukrainian folklore. So that might be an opportunity if you want to get to know people to go along to that. Um, and then just perhaps the last point, Libby said, uh, asked me to announce that she's going to be starting a craft group uh, with some of the refugee women. There's one of them is our neighbor. Her name is uh, Tanya, and she was around at our place this afternoon, and she likes to do crafts. So Libby's starting a little craft group with her, and anyone who'd like to join would be welcome. And then finally, if you want any other information, just you can come and ask me, uh, and I hope I shall share this, I hope to share the site details, um, perhaps through the newsletter uh, with the community. Sorry, thank you. Oh, perhaps you want to say something? <laughs> okay. uh, it happened very quickly, but uh, I was asked if I could uh, have two ladies to come to me. They were supposed to come today, and I think they're hoping to come tomorrow. Uh, it's a mother and her grown-up daughter, and they'll be staying with me for I don't know how long. And that's been done through this informal group, but tomorrow somebody official from Lausanne is coming to see my flat and give me uh, all the paperwork necessary and so on. So tomorrow uh, evening, I hope, because there's been a lot of delays and things, uh, to welcome Svetlana and Tetanya. Thanks, thanks so much, Guy, and thank you, um, Odile. Um, I think it's good for us to, to pray now for, um, for the situation. I was talking to somebody this morning at, at All Saints who had just come from um, no, she'd been in Slovakia, she'd been in Poland, and I think going to Romania next week, but seeing what the churches are doing on that sort of front line, and she was overwhelmed by the generosity of, uh, of Christians, of the churches, of just of the people uh, welcoming folk. And one of the things that she said that really struck me was she said, this is a war 
where the women are separated from the men and they all have mobile phones and every day the women are waiting for that call to tell them that the husband is still alive. That's just how sort of the, the, the pressure, the imminence of this, this, uh, this war situation on them. So I, I would love to do something that we, do, we don't, wouldn't normally do perhaps at St. Peter's, but I'd love to invite you to, to offer your own prayer for the Ukrainian situation and to do so by coming out. Don't all rush out, but I'm going to encourage you to come out and light a candle to symbolize the desire that there be light in the darkness, the light of Christ. Uh, so I'm just going to invite you just to come out, just gradually, and if you stay in your seat and pray, that's fine, but if you'd like to come, light a candle, go back to your seat, and we'll just be, all of us, just praying in our hearts for these dear folk. Today has been uh, designated, certainly in the UK, as a national day of prayer for Ukraine and the churches together have produced a special prayer which I'd like to use now and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. God of all peoples and nations who created all things alive and breathing, united and whole, show us the way of peace that is your overwhelming presence. We hold before you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia. Every child, every adult whom you love so much. We long for the time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares when nations no longer lift up sword against nation. We cry out to you for peace. Protect those whose only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Be with those who are bereaved. Change the hearts of those set on violence and aggression. And fill leaders with the wisdom that leads to peace. Kindle again in us a love of our neighbor and a passion for justice to prevail and a renewed recognition that we all play a part in peace. Creator of all, hear our prayer and bring us peace. Make us whole. Amen. And we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our next song, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
The reading is from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and yet you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him.
Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your name, the name that is so precious to us and we trust so powerful in our world. We meet in your name, we want to know your presence and we want to hear your voice now. Speak, Lord, for your glory's sake. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been trying to get, if you like, a handle on Jesus and particularly his message about the kingdom of God. Because whenever you read the Gospels, you find Jesus speaking again and again about this kingdom. This kingdom which has suddenly become very near and very real. And as you follow Jesus around, you begin to glimpse what this kingdom might look like. He sees sickness and he heals people. He sees people oppressed and he sets them free. He even raises some from the dead. He holds out his hand and touches the untouchable. He reaches out to the outcasts and draws them closer. The kingdom is near. And very often when Jesus was speaking about the kingdom, it was one of those impromptu responses to a, a particular situation where the crowds would gather around him on the shore or on a hillside or in a field or in the street. And he might not even mention God by name, but everyone knew that he was speaking about God in his stories. His stories about farmers and fishermen, about businessmen and kings, families and homemakers. Now, sometimes he did show up in a religious setting. He would appear in the temple or in a synagogue. Uh, the result was normally that the proceedings were disrupted. But if we're going to understand the message of Jesus about his kingdom, we also have to tune in to some of those individual conversations that he had. Because again, the Gospels are peppered with those personal interactions. And one of the best known is that conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus that Eleanor read for us a moment ago from John chapter 3. And it is a conversation about the kingdom of God. Now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three Gospels, we find constant references to the kingdom. It's either the kingdom of God, or in, in Matthew's Gospel, it's the kingdom of heaven. But that isn't the case in John's Gospel. This is actually the only place in John's Gospel where we find that phrase, the kingdom of God. Because usually, in John's Gospel, where we might have expected the phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, John uses the term eternal life. Or sometimes he even reduces it to life or abundant life. I think there's a, there's a problem for us with phrases like kingdom of heaven and eternal life. And we, because we imagine that he's talking about life after death. But I would suggest to you that he's not doing that normally. The, the, the term eternal life is literally the Greek for the life of the ages. A life that is radically different from the life we used to live or the life that most people are living today. A life that is full, a life that is overflowing, a richer life that is focused on a relationship with the Father and with Jesus. It's in Jesus' prayer to his Father in John 17 that we, we find this fascinating statement. Jesus says, this is eternal life. This sounds important, doesn't it? This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. It seems that Jesus is saying to us that eternal life is this interactive relationship with the Father and with his Son. 
And if you think about it, that's really what a kingdom is about. It's about an interactive relationship with a king and with those who are his subjects. But let's go back for a moment to a conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus has come at night time to avoid publicity. It could be awkward for him if he is seen talking to Jesus. Uh, and he begins by saying, teacher, we all know God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. And that sounds like a good opener, doesn't it? But Jesus doesn't seem impressed by that. He, instead, he goes straight to the point. He says, I assure you, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. Jesus says that if we want to experience this life, this abundant life of the kingdom, then something very radical has got to happen. You can't see it, he says, let alone enter it, unless you have been born again. Now, I imagine that many of us can look back with tremendous gratitude to a moment in our lives when we realized that we were not experiencing this new abundant life that Jesus has brought. So we turned around and we, we changed the way we were thinking. We did what the Bible calls repented. And we looked to the cross where Jesus died for our forgiveness and healing. And we accepted Jesus as our saviour and restorer and Lord. And by his spirit, the living Jesus came to us with this gift of new life, the life of the new age. And that experience was, for many of us, so important, so life-changing that many of us would say, we were born again. And that's great, and that's part of my story. However, let me say, I think it's unhelpful when we use born again as an adjective. When people say, oh, I'm a born again Christian, I don't think that's helpful. I don't think it's particularly biblical either. Because what Jesus is talking about here is so much more than a prayer said at the end of a booklet or about some kind of emotional experience at the end of a, of a service. It's very clear that Jesus isn't saying to Nicodemus, oh, Nicodemus, there's, there's another spiritual experience you've got to have. It's something much more radical than that. Jesus is saying to him, Nicodemus, I mean, you're a, a respected teacher yourself, but you're coming to me to hope, in the hope of experiencing this extraordinary life that I have been teaching about. Then if you want that, you're going to have to go back to the beginning. You're going to have to become like a baby. You're going to have to unlearn everything that you've been so sure and certain about so that you can be retaught. Now, Nicodemus has only been with Jesus perhaps a few minutes and already he's confused. Why isn't Jesus making his message clearer? Why is his message so often hidden in parables and metaphors and strange language? So Nicodemus says, well, what do you mean, Jesus? I mean, how can a man who is old go back into his mother's womb and be born again? You're not making any sense. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got some sympathy with Nicodemus. And I find a similar confusion in the next chapter of John's Gospel where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at a well. This half-breed Samaritan who has never even heard of Jesus is surprised that a Jewish man would engage her in conversation and even more so that he would ask her for a drink. And then he says to her, if you knew who I am, you would be asking me for living water, living water. What an evocative image. It sounds like another metaphor for this abundant life, another metaphor for the kingdom of God. But she's confused. What does he mean? And again, we're left wondering why Jesus would be so unclear, why so often he's hiding his message in metaphors. In conversation after conversation, Jesus seems to resist being absolutely direct and unambiguous. He hardly, hardly ever answers a question with a simple answer. Instead, he asks his own question, or he tells a story 
that raises even more questions. So what's going on? Why does Jesus risk being misunderstood? If the message is so important, why, Jesus, don't you make it clear, unambiguous? Why don't you use technical language? Well, it may be that I'll come back to some of those questions uh, on another occasion, but what I want to do now is end with some personal reflections. And the first is to remember that Jesus said, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In other words, this abundant life, this life of the new age, is a relationship with the Father and the Son through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the next most important relationship in my life is with my wife. And over 50 years of experience tells me that this relationship does not depend on unambiguous technical language. Thankfully, there's still a lot of mystery. And there's, a, there's language that is evocative, even poetic. And we're still on a journey of being drawn closer and becoming one. Now, could you imagine that maybe that is what Jesus wants with us? He wants us to experience a journey of drawing closer and becoming one with him. So I want to say to you, don't be put off by the mystery. Welcome the mystery. My second reflection is this, that I realize that we often make the mistake of equating faith with certainty. We, we use our tidy theological categories, we use our preconceived ideas to keep Jesus pretty well tamed. But the more and more I look at scripture through a kingdom I think Jesus is loose and wild, challenging me deeply. I think there's probably somebody on Zoom who needs to mute. We, all right, we've done it, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, so we, we, we can keep Jesus um, pretty well tamed. When I look at Scripture through this kingdom lens, I find Jesus to be wild and, and, and loose, challenging me deeply. You know, sometimes I'm in church and I'm listening to a gospel reading, and at the end of it, you know, the reader says, this is the gospel of the Lord. And everyone else is responding, praise to you, O Christ. I'm thinking, really? This is the good news? I found that very disturbing, very hard, very challenging. So don't you think we should be disturbed by the words of Jesus? So I want to say to you, welcome the challenge. Welcome the mystery. Welcome the challenge. And my third reflection is this. I try to put myself in Nicodemus' place and imagine myself going to Jesus at night. Well, I, I would have to, wouldn't I? Because I'm a vicar. Um, and I've asked, you know, what does Jesus want to say to me? And I wonder if it might be something a bit like this. Tim, I know you're a vicar, but you still don't really understand these things. You've called yourself a born-again Christian for many years. At that time, you knew that you were a sinner deserving condemnation. You've been trusting in my death on the cross for your forgiveness and your restoration. You've let me take away the fear of death and judgment. And over the years, you've come to experience more of my father's love for you as his adopted son. You've opened yourself more to the work of my spirit in your life. But if you want to see the kingdom, if you really want to experience the full life of the kingdom, then you're going to have to be born again. You're going to have to unlearn a lot of things you, you thought were so important and start again. Only then will you see the bigger picture of my purposes for this world. I think what I'm trying to say is that I fear a lot of us 
Yes, even those who are comfortable with the phrase born again. Those who, we've, got the, we've, we've had the religious experience, we've got the t-shirt, we understand grace and the wonder of the cross, we know that our spiritual debts are cancelled, we've got a visa that's going to get us into heaven, but we're still not living the abundant life of the kingdom. There is such a danger that our Christianity is a bolt-on accessory, a compartment that competes with the old life that we are still living. And Jesus calls us to repent, to change the way we think, because the kingdom is close. It's close enough for us to enter. The life of this kingdom, eternal life, abundant life, living water, whatever you want to call it, it's so radically different that we need to be born again. And then we need to hear Jesus invite us to follow him into the world that he loves and longs to heal. To see the whole of life as a gift in which we experience the many blessings of God so that we can join him in blessing all the people he has made and this beautiful world that he wants us to look after. I do not believe that we ever need to repeat that once and for all experience of coming to Christ in repentance and faith and being transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. But I am less convinced than I was that Jesus is talking here to Nicodemus about that once for all religious experience. I find myself wondering if he isn't speaking about a permanent attitude of heart, a humility, an openness of spirit, a lifelong process. And whether or not I call it being born again, I know that that's what I need as I wrestle with this tantalizing message of Jesus and the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that um, we might sense afresh just how incredibly attractive Jesus is. That we would be drawn afresh to him tonight. I pray, Lord, that you give us a hunger to experience more of this abundant life of the kingdom. And that as together as a community we seek to live out that life that we might impact the world around us that so needs your gentle rule. Holy Spirit, encourage us. Help us to rejoice in the mystery. Help us to respond to the challenge. And keep us humble as we seek to walk with you. For your glory. Amen. Guy, I'm going to have to ask you to take over with the slides because I have you've, the iPad just shut down. So we're going to sing our. No, I think now we're going to have a creed, aren't we? We're going to stand. So I'm going to ask you to stand, please. Um, and I want us to declare together our faith in God, just using an adaptation of words from Ephesians 3. So we say together, we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's continue as we sing our final hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain?
And now may the Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly on us and give us peace. Amen. And now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.